Thank you very much and welcome everybody to our uh, town hall question and answer this evening. My name is Tom DeVeo. I'm the superintendent of schools for School District 71. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are on the traditional territories of the Comox First Nation. We would like to thank them for the privilege of living on their land and the gift of working with their children. So this evening we have our special guests are Dr. Sandra Allison and Dr. Charmaine Enns, our medical health officers. Um, Dr. Enns is our medical health officer of the North Island. And Dr. Allison has been working and tasked with the school, uh, dealing with schools throughout this pandemic. So they're here joining us this evening. And we're so pleased, uh, Dr. Enns and Dr. Allison, that you have taken the time to meet with us and answer some of our questions and, and give us some updated information. Uh, we've seen increases um, on the island, specifically the North Island, and there's lots of anxiety and concern as we in, the, in School District 71 have seen uh, our first exposure cases. And we would just like to take this opportunity to learn a little bit more. So uh, Dr. Enz, would you like to begin and sort of give us a, an update of where we're at? Oh, for sure. And thank you very much for the introduction, Tom. And hi, everyone. And thank you so much for the invitation and inviting uh, Dr. Allison and I into your homes and into the conversation this evening. And uh, really do look forward to the talk um, that we, the time we have this evening. Um, I did have a Zoom call with um, hopefully many of you on this call back in September with the school. And so uh, after all of these months, uh, it's time for another conversation. And uh, we are six, six months further down the road with uh, a lot more experience and a lot more confidence, um, and also at a very pivotal place in the pandemic in, in terms of a new tool in our toolbox with vaccine. So I'm just going to give uh, just a, a very high level um, overview of, of our response and what we're trying to do in terms of COVID in public health, and then also a bit of an epi summary of numbers of what's currently happening on the island and specifically in the North Island. So with COVID, um, we've had three primary goals in terms of this pandemic. Those three primary goals have been one, to limit severe outcomes, mainly severe disease and death. That has been a primary goal. Number two, um, a primary goal has been to um, ensure that the healthcare system can function and that it is uh, able to do the job it needs to do, that it has capacity. And lastly, a major goal has been to limit social disruption. Um, you will notice none of those goals are to stop or eliminate COVID transmission. That's not possible. COVID is here, COVID is here to stay, and it is now part of our winter viruses and respiratory viruses. It's probably gonna change over time like, other, like all viruses do, but COVID isn't going away. So our goal isn't to make COVID go away. Now, when you look at the first two the, of, of those factors, how well are we doing in them? Well, in the first one, um, severe disease and death, just with the small amount of vaccine that's already been given in British Columbia, and with it being prioritized to long-term care residents and staff, we now have seen a significant drop in severe disease and death. Hospitalizations have dropped, severe outcomes have dropped and our death rate is down. So just a small amount of vaccine has gone a very long way for the people that are most vulnerable for this, uh, for this pandemic. Number two, healthcare system capacity. How are we doing with the healthcare system? The healthcare system is in great shape. We have tons of capacity in our healthcare system. Right now on Vancouver Island, there's a total of 10 people in hospital with COVID. So we have lots and lots of capacity. Our healthcare system is not strained with COVID. Lastly, social disruption. This is where we have a lot of work to do. Our pandemic response has caused significant social disruption. And um, that is not something that is, is gonna change overnight. Hopefully as we uh, see more of the population vaccinated, well, I know as we have more of the population vaccinated and we start to get closer to herd immunity, we're going to see more and more um, um, restrictions uh, in our everyday life become less and social disruption will become uh, hopefully a, a thing we can talk about from 
as a memory. But, but social disruption is not to be minimized because it has so much impact on our lives, quality of life, mental health, social cohesion, um, uh, it's, it's just so many things. Now, in terms of numbers, right now, actively on Vancouver Island, we have 272 cases of COVID uh, and, uh, and we're monitoring about 800 people as close contacts. For the North Island, there are 68 active cases. So the whole top half of Vancouver Island has 68 cases. I realize this is more than we're used to, but it is still a, not a surprise in a pandemic. We're in a global pandemic and while the North Island has enjoyed very low rates or numbers of COVID, um, we now have a small number, which seems like a lot compared to the very low numbers that we had. So I just wanna keep in perspective. Last week we had more, we had I think 77 active cases in North Island. So we're already seeing the benefits of containment with case identification and close contact follow-up that that's containing transmission and those numbers of cases is coming down. Of um, for the cases um, and the majority of cases, not only for Vancouver Island, uh, not only for North Island, but for all of Vancouver Island, the vast majority of cases, um, uh, the transmission is occurring in, in social gathering. It's, it's those uh, friends, it's those birthday parties, it's so I'll just come over for dinner and it ends up being a few hours. It's, um, it's social gathering close together for prolonged periods of time outside of controlled environments. This is where transmission is happening. I also would like to just reassure you about variants. We have had a total of six variants identified on Vancouver Island. None of them are associated with schools in any way and all six are related to travel. So variants at this point in time have not impacted us uh, to any of any significance on Vancouver Island. But again, let's not be surprised about variants. We expect variants, that's how viruses operate. Um, and, uh, uh, and we're monitoring, just so you also be reassured, we're monitoring, we're looking for it, but it, it just hasn't happened for us yet. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Allison, and she's gonna give us more specifics about Comox Valley and schools in COVID. Thanks, Sandy. Thank you, Charmaine, very much for your wisdom. And I'm always so incredibly grateful to um, uh, learn from you and, and work with you and following you is a very difficult um, task. So I'll try my best. With respect to the Comox Valley and the North Island, uh, school um, exposures. There are six exposures on the website and two of them will be removed in the next day. Um, uh, two of those in the area in the Comox Valley, but there are five schools that we are following with respect to exposures in the school. And so when we have an exposure at the school, what that is is a, an individual case that may be a teacher, a student, a parent volunteer, a custodian, an administrative assistant, it could be anyone. And we really try hard not to single out who that individual is at the school because what's most important and the social contract that the health system has with parents and families with, uh, that trust the schools is that we'll disclose any case that's in that school. And that's of any um, severity or consequence. This is a transparency maneuver. And so with those um, exposures, many of those schools are small number of cases. And um, with respect to the um, uh, contacts, a very small number of contacts, except, except in the one situation of the school, GP Vanier. And I think that's where most of the interest and concern arises because that school serves a very large area and has a large number of students at it. And so in the community, as Charmaine mentioned, more cases showing up in the community means more cases showing up in our workplaces. And that's the work that I'm doing in addition to schools is following up in our workplaces and clusters in our work sites. And we are seeing those in the Comox Valley as well as exposures to many different people in many different walks of life, whether they're first responders or healthcare or in our schools. And so that's what we're seeing. So of these five school exposures, um, and, and particularly in the GP Vanier, over 80% of those contacts should be returning to school. 
And of all of those contacts that were monitored for the period of monitoring, we had no secondary cases that were arising from transmission within the school setting. And so that just proves to me the effectiveness of our public health response in that we rapidly identify close contacts in the school setting and we um, ask them voluntarily to isolate in their homes to reduce the risk of transmission in the school setting to preserve that protective environment for the rest of the students in the school. But I wanna reflect on what Charmaine also, also said about um, uh, social disruption. Because for a high number, more than 80 people um, in the Comox Valley to be going into isolation to protect the school is a very significant impact. And to not have any cases arise from that isolation shows the great dedication of the community to isolate and protect the schools. So one of the questions I'm commonly asked is, are the schools safe? And I absolutely believe the schools are safe because I am carefully monitoring the schools and the people who are isolated. And any cases that arise in the community, we act rapidly. And so when I think about how well are the schools doing and responding, I've been able to gauge the performance of school superintendents, just like Tom DeMeo across the island as I've watched different communities become more active in their coronavirus cases. And as I reflect in my work in the schools over the last month and a half, I've seen the wave of cases go right across from the Cowichan Valley to Nanaimo up to the um, Comox Valley. So I deeply appreciate how anxiety provoking this can be for everyone in the community. And I'm very, very glad to be here to answer all questions around the response in school because I am convinced that for every school superintendent that is responding to the needs, the educational needs, the social needs, and the mental wellness needs of our community and their families and their children that allow people to go to work, that allow children to continue to learn, there's very little burden. Aside from the anxiety that we are experiencing, particularly um, in your community at this time. So I'll stop there. I want you to know that we're on the job, Dr. Anz and I, ensuring that we're on top of things. And I know that when the community has anxiety, we really do rally around the superintendents to ensure that we are here to answer your questions. So thank you for coming and thank you for making time for us this evening. Thank you, Dr. Elson, Dr. Ann. So there's a, a Q and A function. And I do believe uh, we've got some questions. And so we have Jeff Manning, uh, Paul Berry and Josh Porter are manning that and Alan Douglas. So I'll turn it over. Uh, and uh, feel free to begin some of the questions. Um, okay, well, thanks a lot for coming on, Dr. Allison and Dr. Enns. Um, I think uh, it's probably best if we run from the first questions that were sent in and just work our way down just to make sure that we don't miss any questions. So the first question that's being asked is, can you please give a rationale for having substitute teachers going into all the schools and not staying within a cohort? This seems to be the same issue that the nursing homes faced with the spreading from site to site. They've ended up changing the same site to, to same site employment. Thank you. So they're asking about the rationale for why are we allowing TTOCs or teachers on call to go to different buildings uh, instead of keeping them all at the same building. Starting with the tough I'm one. Not, I'm not used to, I'm not used to, uh, it's so good to have uh, Dr. Allison here, but I'm, I'm wondering if that's also, a, uh, it might be good, part of me? I was curious if it was a school district question. Sure, yeah, I can jump in on that part. Part of that, the rationale behind it is with the safety protocols that we have in place, um, if we were to restrict uh, individuals to just go to one site, it would limit the employment of that TTOC to just that one site. You would then be in a situation where some of our TTOCs would have more work than others uh, just because of the nature, could be because of the size uh, of the particular um, school. That question was asked, we looked at it. We felt um, working with the health and safety committee that we were able to provide a safe environment for our employees to work in and 
that's uh, that's where we came with the decision to allow our TTOCs using uh, PPE to uh, go into the buildings and and, uh, and work. Thank you very much, Tom, for that um, uh, report. And I believe that that's in accordance with the guidelines that are dictated by the province. And certainly in our work with the rapid response team and the Ministry of Education, we'll be fine tuning those recommendations to ensure they um, are meeting the needs of both schools and uh, the safety needs of public health. Um, what I can tell you from my investigations in schools is that that has not been a source of concern for me, and particularly when individuals wear masks. And so long as our teachers are masked and our TTOCs are almost uniformly masked in the classroom setting, I completely feel confident in that. Now, um, there have been situations where people have not attended to their personal protective equipment, and that's when we have seen transmission in a school. And it hasn't been because they've been at multiple schools. It's been because there's a failure of PPE. So going back to the original messages of ensuring that you're using the appropriate precautions, I believe keeps everybody safe. Um, and I just have one thing I'd like to add to that, because uh, I agree with all of that is also our own responsibility to not come to work sick. So I know that staff are very aware of that and, um, uh, and that is also for students. So, uh, and for all of us who work somewhere else <laughs> or go to buy our groceries or whatever we do, we should not be doing that if we have symptoms. So um, those multi, that multi-barrier approach starts with us managing ourselves in terms of, uh, uh, our own social interactions and, um, and monitoring our own symptoms so that um, we don't put others, um, so, so that we don't potentially expose others because we decide we're going to go do it even though we have symptoms. Okay, thank you. The, the second question, uh, there were fewer cases last year when schools were operating in an online format. Why this year are we not operating online even though cases are now increasing? Do you want to take a chance at that there, Superintendent, and then I'll follow you up? Um, I, I think in an online format, I think is it anything, we learned a lot of when this first hit last March and we were unsure of, of the response. And I think if you look at the research, having students out of school is far greater damage to our students than it is um, and we're weighing that. And, and I think given what we know about COVID-19 now versus what we knew last a year ago, we've learned a lot. And I think we have created with the assistance of, of uh, Island Health and, and medical health officers around, we've created protocols and processes to make sure our environments are safe for students. And that's why our students are in schools. Dr. Allison? Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Tom. Absolutely. I'm fully convinced that the protective environment of the school, including the social connections that are absolutely accomplished in a safe manner in that environment, are promotive of improved mental wellness and preventing those connections by having people work in an online space where they no longer have that connection absolutely hazards increased mental stress and distress. The connections that are found in the school are protective. So somebody would say, well, why not just have it all online and we'll just have all that social interaction at home because we're all friends and that's, but you heard what Dr. Ann said at the beginning, we are seeing increased transmission in the Valley because of social connectivity, increased numbers of social contacts per case. At times, our contacts per case has exceeded what we've seen in the past several months. And that just guides us to um, increase our messages around, please be responsible in the number of individuals whom you 
um, have within your immediate social circle. Because when we do an end investigation, we have seen a number of contacts per case in excess of 25, which is really a remarkable number of people to be in contact with when you're infectious. And that happens in your community. So my advice, and I did hear from Dr. Enns, is that we do have an element of personal responsibility and tending to um, our basic measures of staying home when you're unwell, keeping your distance from others, traveling only for essential means and really trying to limit your social um, exposure. Now, um, we mentioned very early on, vaccine is on the horizon. So there's a really excellent opportunity that's coming up when we start moving into phase two at the community level and really fully roll out our vaccination in the community. And I'm really pleased to see an active and engaged community looking at preventing disease. And I don't believe that's through closing schools and having students learn online at home. Mr. Douglas. Great. Um, thanks, Dr. Enns and Dr. Allison for being here tonight. And I scrolled through and looked at a lot of the questions and your opening comments covered a great deal of them. But th this question is, I'm wondering why it is considered safe for the siblings if those students who are isolating to attend school, wouldn't it be safer for everyone if all members of a family go into isolation? I'll try and take an, a, a, a chance at addressing that. And Charmaine, please um, add anything if I miss. I'm going to presume that the individual asking the question is asking about a high risk contact. So not a case, because if in fact, the individual was isolating at home as a case, their siblings that live in the household would be isolating as well as close household contacts. For individuals who are high risk contacts and in the incubation period, it is a value trade-off that we recognize that if we were to isolate every contact of a contact, we would essentially have 80% of our population in isolation. So we know the natural history of the disease. We know that it takes time to develop uh, symptoms. We know that when the symptoms develop, we can isolate, um, we can identify through testing that they have an infection and that individual in isolation becomes a case. So those individuals in the home can carry on their lives, but we do ask that people isolate from that high risk contact in that setting. So public health asks people to really try and keep their distance from their household contacts in that setting. And in certain situations, we help support that isolation offsite if that's necessary. Thank you. I, I just, would, just, uh, just wanna add, uh, just from a more holistic approach, you know, the question about would it be safer, um, it, it implies that the only thing of concern is COVID. COVID is not the only thing happening or the only risk in our lives. So, so having a whole family, like, so the, the science doesn't bear up, like uh, Dr. Allison said, to, that we don't isolate contacts of contacts. That, that just does not, that doesn't bear up with the evidence or the science. Um, and, and nor has it, nor has that uh, been an issue in this real life pandemic either. I mean, we, we know that, that we have time when somebody does develop symptoms that um, if we can, we, they're, they're even more isolated and the, the virus transmission is contained. But what, what we're not considering is what are the impacts of what we're doing to, to isolate. So, so going be already our measures are, I, you know, above and beyond, we have we have requested an incredible amount from the population with our, with our request for isolation based on cases and contacts. To go more than that would mean even more potential harm than, than is already happening. So COVID is not the only thing in your life or your kid's life or your family's life. Loss of work, loss of, um, of so social relationships, loss of education, loss of confidence, distress, uh, um, substance use, um, violence, uh, things that happen at home that we don't know anything about. Uh, so there, we have to, I think, continue to take a holistic approach, knowing that there's many things in our lives that matter. Food security has been severely challenged. Um, so many, the normal things of life, we anticipate that it's probably going to take our youth and our young adults about 10 years to recover from the impacts of this past year. Their life has been put on hold, their life interrupted, they're not in school, and this includes university students, and the impact has been profound, far more profound than COVID itself. So I just would ask that we 
um, we consider all of the aspects of what's involved in what we're asking of, our, of other people and what that means when it happens to us ourselves. Thank you. Next question. Um, Josh, are you gonna be asking any of these or is it just the three of us? Go for it, Jeff. Okay, so, so the next question uh, isn't really a question but they're asking about uh, what the school district is doing to enforce mask policies. Uh, and I'm, I'm guessing that it's mostly a high school question. So I don't know if uh, Mr. Berry wants to take that or Mr. DeMeo. Yep, certainly, I'm, I'm happy to answer that. Um, we are speaking with our schools regularly. Uh, we are asking our staff to make sure that they are modeling the safety protocols that we are asking of everyone and that they are enforcing uh, those, those protocols uh, in their classrooms in the unstructured times in the school. Um, we, we have audited each of our schools uh, through our health and safety committees to make sure that those protocols are being followed. But we also recognize that we're dealing with adolescent youth and they don't always follow all of the rules uh, either at home or at school. And so when they are not social distancing when we hope they would, uh, we're, we've encouraged all staff to make sure that they speak with, with students and ask them to make sure that they maintain their distance and then they push, put their masks on. I've been in quite a number of schools over the last few days and uh, at, at the number of them, I see administrators standing at the front doors, welcoming students and handing them a mask if they're choosing not to wear one. So I, I do believe that we are enforcing, uh, but the reality is we can't be everywhere every moment. And we are asking our students, particularly our high school students to continue to model with us. Thank you. Next question. Mr. Berry. So what are we doing to address the uh, SD71 student concerns? Um, I, I'm assuming uh, this is a response to the, uh, the recent uh, petition. Uh, and, and certainly we hope that this forum is one opportunity to respond to your concerns and to provide you the information that uh, should help comfort you in knowing that we have had very few, six or seven uh, active cases uh, amongst our student and staff populations. And that because of the work of, of health and the school district together, together we have had no other secondary uh, infections as a result. So all of the systems we have to keep you safe are working. Yeah. So to take it a little bit further, the DC Center for Disease Control, our colleagues and our experts have reviewed the evidence related to the impact of closure of schools. And I encourage the school leadership to circulate that document to the school community so that you can maybe have a deeper look at <clears throat> the concerns raised by our colleagues, which include all of the impacts that we mentioned, the loss of the protective environment, the loss of the um, individual connection to not only their, co co their peers in the cohort, but those protective adults, the access to additional services that may be health services, social services, or even food programs. Um, so we recognize that when we um, respond in public health, we have a responsibility, an ethical responsibility to use what's called the least restrictive means to achieve the goals we want to achieve. And both Dr. Enns and I and all other medical health officers in the province recognize that there is an undue burden on youth and children in schools, particularly when we respond in heavy handed manners or exclude or isolate large numbers of people because they and their families are impacted. So I hope that students, as they reflect on this, can see their other students returning to school, the individuals who were in isolation can return to school. There's only 15% of the contacts that we had in isolation. So we're almost back to a full school complement wherein everybody can enjoy each other's company and the social uh, protective environment that occurs in the school. So um, I hear those students saying they're afraid. And I understand that in the Comox Valley, there have not been um, the number of cases that have been experienced elsewhere. And I acknowledge that it is 
fear that it's driving this. But at, at some point in time, individuals have to trust the system that's in place and the evidence that's brought forward and understand that the perspectives are perhaps disproportionately jaded by fear. And when I look at the cases, and I'm very pleased to see that the case numbers are trending downward in the Comox Valley, as mentioned by Dr. Enns, and we see students returning to school. And we understand that the interventions that we need to do, including uh, encouragement of masks rather than enforcement, um, internal motivation is always a preferable motive than external, um, but the students have a role in this and the students have a responsibility in this. And so I hope that the students will engage in the school in trying to ensure that the environment is safe for their return because it is far more protective for their um, education, far more protective for their futures. I'm really trying to look at getting back to school. On the bright side, for post-secondary institutions, we believe the province will be issuing notification that we really want to be back in school, in person, in fall. And so we're really looking with an eye on that um, uh, horizon. And I encourage everyone that can to get vaccinated when that becomes available. Yeah. Thank Encouraging you. vaccination. Yeah, thanks. Dr. Enns? Yeah, you know, this is a really important discussion. Um, I think sometimes we might uh, we we want we might want a quick fix and um, and and it might not be the, as easy as it sounds. Uh, so so uh, completely agree with everything Dr. Allison has said. Completely agree. And you know um, if we think about this in terms of th this isn't a trade off uh, because if we th the the reality is. Um, and it's been demonstrated over and over again in BC and in Canada and globally that COVID is not amplified in schools. There is not an increase amount of COVID because of schools or people being in school. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's actually a, a very low risk environment. There's no, no risk, okay? There's no, no risk. I said low risk. Now let's think about spring break coming up. I think most of us are more nervous about spring break and kids not being in school and school not happening and what that means for the likelihood of transmission with social gathering and meeting and droplets being uh, shared at, by being close to each other, laughing, close, talking, sharing drinks or et cetera. So, so um, the, the, ri the risk of, of transmission is um, just, if we just step back and just think about that, like why is everybody nervous about spring break? It's because school's not in session. That's why we're nervous about spring break. So, um, and that's because again, schools are a protective place and um, as it relates to COVID specifically, it's protective for a lot of other things. But when we're, if we're gonna talk just about COVID, we are not protecting you or making your life better by, by shutting down schools. Thank you for that. I was just noticing we've got lots of questions and thank you for those. We're going to do our best to work through some more questions, but the ones that we don't get a chance to address uh, in our conversation this evening, we will record and we will try to have that information in, on our website. Um, there's a link on our COVID page and we will have some Q and A's from this evening that we will be able to have some answers uh, on there so that people will be able to check that, uh, that off. Mr. Douglas, do you have another question for us? Yeah, so our next question is, what percent of the population needs to be vaccinated before we achieve herd immunity? Dr. Allison, I think you're muted and so is Dr. Enns. I'm hopeful that Charmaine jumps in on this one. Oh, okay, I think, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, So based on the very, uh, the, the excellent protective uh, benefits with a single dose of COVID vaccine. Uh, if we can get 70, 75% of the population vaccinated, we'll be well onto our way to herd immunity. Thank you. Mr. Berry or Mr. Manning, I'm not sure which one's next. I think the next question has already been answered. It talks about uh, transmission of cases in the school setting. So I'm gonna jump down to another question. It's a bit speculative, but uh, the question is, how do you see things going forward post-vaccine when there is nothing yet for children? 
Uh, so, so hopefully the um, recommendations for uh, vaccine for the pediatric population will, is not too far off, but there is a lot of um, uh, tr trials and uh, work being done to, to determine um, what's the appropriate vaccine and the appropriate dose for our under 16 and under 18 year olds. So that work is happening. I don't know when, none of us know when we're gonna have those vaccines approved. But, um, but again, let's come back to what our goals are. Our goal is not to have no transmission. Our goal is to reduce those severe outcomes. And we know that if we have a vaccinated adult population, which, which is fantastic, and we have a population, uh, a significant portion of our population that's not vaccinated but does not carry the burden of COVID, we're in a really good place. So um, even, even without our youth being vaccinated, but I, but I know that uh, there's work being done right now examining some of our approved vaccines if we can lower the age even down to 12. So th that, um, th th you know, as, as soon as we know and we have it, we will be providing it, but uh, nobody is able to provide us with a date at this time. Thank you, Mr. Barry. Okay, I'm just trying to get back into order here on the questions. Um, this, this deals with school buses. I'm concerned about safety measures on school buses. I understand that kids from various schools and cohorts ride together on the same bus and they do not wear masks. How is the school addressing and enforcing safety measures on buses? Do you want to take that one, Paul, or do you? I, I can do it. Sure. Um, in, in, in following the protocols that have been provided by uh, the province and BCCDC, uh, all of our buses, uh, we require students who are 11 years and older to be masked all the time. Uh, we encourage students to sit in cohort groups and we encourage them to sit with siblings if, if possible. Um, on the buses, we have uh, enhanced cleaning processes on the buses. Bus windows are, are lowered to increase the airflow. Um, at, at this point, we know and, and certainly have the evidence that there has been no transmission on our buses utilizing the, the protocols that we have currently, uh, with, that we are currently using. I should just point out for those that don't know, uh, Paul Berry is our Director of Instruction Health and Safety and was the lead in developing our health and safety protocol in our district, which we are quite proud of because that formed the foundation and was shared with many districts and institutions across the province uh, around uh, protocols for returning to school. So for those who don't know who Paul is, that's his, his title. Next question, Mr. Douglas. We understand the people that have had COVID are in a sense immune now. Do these people and the people that have been vaccinated still have to follow the same rules as those that have not had COVID or have not been vaccinated? You know, that's an interesting question because rules are very broad. And so someone who has had a coronavirus infection that we are aware of and then becomes exposed again by another case, we would consider them to be at this point in time uh, post-infectious and so no longer susceptible. You do develop natural immunity after an infection, yet we still recommend vaccination for all individuals that are eligible for vaccine, regardless of whether they've been infected or not. Um, when it comes to following rules, um, we do have public health measures that we recommend everybody be following regardless of their vaccination status, including maintaining, <clears throat> pardon me, a small number of social contacts, still limiting their social contact, still um, uh, keeping their safe physical distance from others and wearing a mask. And until we get to a point where we have a high enough level of population vaccination, where we can consider the relaxation of all measures but we won't be preferentially treating individuals after an infection differently or after vaccination differently. Um, the entire population will be addressed in the same manner. Thank you. Okay, the next question I believe has been addressed talking about uh, the petition, whether that's been addressed. So I'm gonna to go to the following one. Uh, 
It's an interesting question. They say, I wonder why the vaccine is not offered to school age children age 16 and above at the beginning, as they have to be in schools and groups with people at younger ages, uh, while older people do not need to be in contact with others. So it's kind of a philosophical question, I think. Yeah, yeah. I'll take, oh, oh, go ahead, Charmaine. Go ahead, Sent. no, Sent. go ahead. <laughs> you can follow me up. I was going to say that um, certainly we try and use the vaccination strategy that makes the most sense to reduce the burden in the quickest manner. And we were seeing the rates of mortality and morbidity in the or deaths and illness in our extreme ages. And so we rapidly mobilized to vaccinate that age group. Now, we do not see severe illness or disease in that 16 to 18 year old population. That's not to say that we won't be offering them vaccination. They're absolutely eligible, but they'll be in a further stage of our phases of vaccination. And so um, certainly uh, with the way it's looking right now for vaccination and our vaccine supply is very favorable at this point in time. And as Charmaine mentioned, with the new vaccines that are coming, the new evidence that's coming, I believe that we'll see a, a shift in the recommendations over time. All right, next question, Mr. Berry. Uh, my concern is that after every holiday, the number of COVID, uh, COVID cases increases. It would be terrible if schools would need to close because of a spike of cases and possible spread. Is there consideration to cancel spring break? And I, I think that's already been addressed. Not at this point in time. Now let's go yeah. on to the next one. Am I understanding correctly that when one person tests positive at a long-term care facility, it is considered an outbreak, whereas in a school, it's considered an exposure. You muted, you muted, uh, Sandra. That's me saying, "Go ahead, Charmaine, take it." Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like playing a game show. You keep who's who's going to get to the button first? Oh, I got it! I got it! So. Uh, Okay, you know, I, 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 I appreciate the question and I, I think I understand where it's coming from, but, but we also have to step back and look at that um, uh, th there's different interventions based on the amount of risk to the population in that place. So for example, we don't, you'll hear that we don't talk about community outbreaks. We're in a pandemic, so we expect cases and we're basically all in an outbreak right now. Uh, but you'll hear um, the term outbreak um, in for long-term care facilities with a single case because um, that was defined early in the pandemic because of the consequences and the severity of what it meant for frail elderly to be exposed to COVID um, and the likelihood of transmission within that site. Now, obviously it's not the residents, the residents are have been basically confined throughout this pandemic. So it's staff who are exposed and infected that bring it into the long-term care facility. So if one person, if there's one case in a long-term care facility, that means there can be um, a, a significant amount of potential exposure to very vulnerable people. Um, and so that's why the intervention and the restrictions have been so severe I'm going to use that word um, to to balance out um, because of the amount of risk and the um, to to uh, to seniors in those facilities. That's not the same risk in our schools, um, and so most of the time you'll hear us talk about clusters. We talk about community clusters. We talk about worksite clusters. We talk about schools. Uh, most school issues are a single school exposure. Most schools don't have clusters, um, so. Um, I know the terminology can be confusing sometimes, but they're not equally used for all of our um, all of our scenarios. Okay. Thank you. Okay, our next question is: Why have the students of GP Vanier not been emailed about the exposures on February nineteenth, twenty third, twenty fifth, and twenty sixth? Only parents and guardians were emailed about the exposures. Our practice is we send email notification out to the contact, the school contact that we have. We do not send individual email outs to our students. 
Okay, here's another terminology question. Is, the, uh, is there still a mister misunderstanding about cases versus close contacts versus casual contacts? And how can we clarify this? So a case is uh, diagnosed by a lab result and that's reported to public health. So there's no confusion for me about what a case is. That's what I'm following up. Close contact and then what we'll say the term there was casual contacts or low risk contacts um, are defined through our risk assessment process. And we work in close collaboration with school leadership, Tom and Paul, and the, super, uh, the principals and the teachers involved um, and whoever else is, is necessarily involved at the school to determine who may have had what's defined as close high risk contact. And close contact is being within six feet for 15 minutes or more without a mask. And one of those individuals is in their infectious period. You know, while we are very, we use rules of thumb as a physician, I try to decrease risk and respond in a manner that helps me understand um, to do it with the, with the least harm to individuals. So I know that individuals are most infectious on day three to six of their infectious period. And then as time goes on, their infectious load is lower. If somebody does not have symptoms or they're without symptoms in a setting, by necessity, you need symptoms to transmit a respiratory illness. So those are some of the factors that come into play as I'm trying to determine whether something is high risk. If people are wearing masks, I consider that to be medium risk in almost all situations. And I encourage mask use because I use it in my risk assessments. And so if individuals are masked, I consider that to be almost always medium or low risk. And there are very few high risk contacts. And I think our superintendents already know where the risk points are for the staff at the school to decrease high risk contact. We limit our break room contact. We try to in, intentionally um, direct our staff to not have social gatherings in the lunchroom or the break room. And certainly that's the setting where we see in adults, the most common transmission. Thank you. Next question. So this question, uh, what percentage of children experience lingering illness or fatigue following COVID-19? Mm -hmm. Definite doctor question. Yes, it is. And I actually don't think that I have that um, information, nor do I think it's come up in information that I've heard. Charmaine, have you heard of any no. lingering? No. So we have even, yeah, we have such small numbers of hospitalization of anyone under 30 in British Columbia. The numbers are just so small. Um, I, I'm not aware of anything on that. Okay. Our next question is, when will the district announce what the semester system will look like next year, i.e. will high school still be in a quarterly system? Great question. And, and that's a, it's a tough question to answer because we're still waiting um, to determine what the direction will be for September. We're hoping we're going to be, if you think, we came from a five stage where five was, was closed and one is fully uh, open and, and currently we're at a two. Uh, the hope is that we're at one or as close to one as we can get. Uh, a lot of factors come into play. Schools right now are planning and what we've asked our schools to do is start thinking long-term, how are we going to move? If it's easier uh, to plan knowing that if we start at, a, for example, schools may start at a quarter, go to a semester than it is what we experienced this year, which was start at a semester and then have to go to a quarter. Uh, so I know each individual school is working with their school community to decide what is their timetable format for next year and what makes most sense. Uh, currently speaking to schools today, they are just starting the course selection. So for our students, you'll see regular course selection and they will, once that's done, then schools will begin the process of timetabling. If it is a, a quarter that the school decides that's the direction they're going in, 
then they will look at proper spacing of courses so that one of the things we heard loud and clear this year was uh, how it was stressful when students had heavy academic loads for one quarter and then maybe an elective, two electives the next quarter. So trying to, to uh, disp uh, disperse that over the year. So as I say, it's, it's not a clean cut answer because we're not sure what September is going to look like. We're trying to plan for all um, scenarios at this point in time to the best of our ability. And schools are working on it as we speak. Okay, next question. What about siblings of students that go to Vanier? Could there be spread to elementary schools from them? See, um, so there's no spread from students that go to Vanier. I think it's really important that we understand the mechanism that there are cases in our community. So certainly the spread, and I mentioned high risk close contact, that's the setting. So in our homes and in our social gatherings, where you're sitting together with your friends or family around a dinner table, where you're eating, drinking, no masks for anything longer than 15 minutes. That's where um, the transmission happens. Um, it is striking to me to think that a school could be labeled um, and the students therein um, in a manner that might have them stigmatized or vulnerable for being marginalized. And so public health is working hard to isolate cases as soon as they're discovered. We isolate their high-risk contacts. We don't isolate contacts of contacts. And there are many cases in the community. I heard Charmaine say 68 or something close to that in the North Island. And, they're, um, and them and their contacts are isolating all around us from many different workplaces, from many different settings. And so, yes, cases of individuals from Vanier are safe to go to all settings, including other schools. Um, and I wouldn't want anybody who has a sibling at Vanier to be thought of any differently. We have, we're in the middle of a pandemic, right? And there's cases everywhere. So yeah, please be kind to each other. Thank you. Next question. So what can be done to shorten the timeline between an outbreak or case identified in a school and the wider population being notified? And the examples were that Highland exposure, the Highland exposure took place on Monday the 22nd, the letter went out on Sunday the 28th and similarly for Aspen Park. Oh, all of this is entirely dependent upon somebody getting tested. And if they don't get tested until the very last day of their symptoms, this is not uncommon that we determine that somebody is tested on the last day of their infectious period and they intend attended school that entire time. And so it is a perceived delay because as soon as we are issued that um, uh, the lab result, we interview and we're engaged with the school within hours and we invariably have the letter out that night. So that delay isn't necessarily a uh, delay in the system of notification. It may be because someone was attending school while they were feeling unwell or attending a workplace when they were unwell and, and it happens and they don't get tested until later on. I can tell you the turnaround time from the time we connect with either Dr. Allison or Dr. Huayano and the letter is usually 24, less than 24 hours if it's a weekend. Um, during the week, uh, the occasion that happened, it was a matter of four, four hours possibly to turn it over. So um, weekends, it, it doesn't matter. We try to get that information out as quickly as we possibly can. Okay, next. Our, I think our next question has been answered, but I'll just read it out loud. What criteria determines a high risk close contact with a person who has been diagnosed with COVID-19? I think Dr. Allison, you've covered that uh, really clearly. So I'll go to the next one. And could you comment on why are masks not mandatory for elementary school students? I mentioned before that students may or may not comply or be able to comply with mask wearing. And certainly in the younger students, it has been reported that 
they either will maybe trade masks with another student. I've heard about students wiping the desk with their mask and then wearing it. So it's really important that when we make a recommendation and I don't make things mandatory because people don't generally do things when you tell them they have to do things. Um, and having students wear masks ineffectively that may introduce them to exposure or um, be unhygienic. And so we certainly see at a certain age level, and I think the school district mentioned age 11, seems to be an age that we can expect students that to wear them um, in a manner that would you know, encourage their safety and not compromise anyone else's or their own. Thank you. Okay, the next question, what are the actual thresholds that need to be reached where it would be escalate to the point where the response would be to close a school? That's a great question. Over my time of doing this and across the province, the only time that schools have been closed is when there's been a significant impact to the staff at the school and the ability to operate the school. We have not seen, particularly in the island region, number of cases where the public health action has been to close a school. It has been invariably the action of the school knowing they can't operate. And so that's been the case across the island. Mr. Berry. Um, given that perhaps 40% of COVID cases are asymptomatic and, e and even a higher percentage in pediatric cases, and given that BC does not generally do asymptomatic testing, how do you truly know the degree of COVID exposures or transmissions in schools or prevalence of COVID in the community? So we test symptomatic people and we diagnose cases in symptomatic people because by necessity, you need to be symptomatic to spread that. Asymptomatic transmission or transmission from surfaces or fomites has not proven to be any source of concern in this pandemic. It has been people who are symptomatic where we see transmission. We try not to test asymptomatic people because that confuses the issue. Old infections, and maybe this has happened to people, can be diagnosed up to three months after. So we do diagnose old infections. And so we try not to test asymptomatic people. Asymptomatic people do not spread the disease. The last I saw in the literature regarding spread from a close contact who was asymptomatic was less than 1% of cases. So really not something that I'm worried about when I know that people are in the workplace and symptomatic and um, continuing to attend. So less worried about the asymptomatic people really want people with symptoms to stay home. Thank you. Okay, hey, this, this one's a very long question, so here it goes. I'm following my children's lead and their feelings about attending school. I've allowed them to stay home for the last 10 days and do school work from home. They say COVID procedures are not consistently followed at school, plus the fact that cohorts end up mixing when they're made to stand outside during non-class times. How do you convince the students it's safe to be at school when they know or see cohorts mixing? So outdoor exposures are never something that I'm concerned about. Recess, before school, after school, that's not some time where we have seen transmission. So mixing of cohorts um, in the playground, I'm not worried about that. So no concern there. Um, uh, even close contact in between individuals. Um, we've seen people standing in line outdoors because there's invariably, um, it's an open system. Um, it's really not a concern. And with children, even less so. Well, I just have, have one comment about that. Um, you know, my, my kids are now in their 20s, but there's lots of times, you know, they would have wanted to talk me into something else, but I'm the parent. So, you know, I, I think it's really important that we not, um, that we take the opportunity to encourage our children not to be afraid of each other uh, because um, the, 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 the mixing of cohorts, like what's that really about? Um, that, is that because they're, they're, they have a fear of people spending time with each other? So we need to make sure, I think, that we can encourage our children not to be afraid of each other, not to be afraid of our neighbors, not to be afraid of our friends, not to be afraid of other people playing with other people. I mean, I, I know that I don't, I don't 
really know um, exactly how to how to answer that question, ex except that um, uh, it's a, it's an interesting question or it's an interesting dilemma uh, for for you as a parent because um, um, what what your children are observing. But why do they see that as something that's so important in terms of risk? Um, I think that that's I think probably all of us need to help message that because. I am concerned about how we view each other after the end of this pandemic um, and how, um, how uh, critical we are of each other. Um, so we need to, uh, wow, we, we need to make sure we can extend uh, that humanness back to each other. And kids are so fabulous at that, right? They have so much capacity and so much uh, resiliency and um, uh, the, the ability to be friends. So uh, th thank you for the question. and. Um, Thanks for letting me just ramble a bit about that one. I'm going to ramble a little bit further because I think what you said just brought me to a spot where I really want folks to just take a pause and think about what you went through with the five or seven schools. And I think that's the story that you can tell to those kids is that there were one case or a few cases in a serial manner at the school because the community has a lot of activity, but we responded people went into isolation, they came back out, they went back to school, there's no more cases. Uh, it's a very anticlimactic kind of situation because I mean, I watch Outbreak in the movies and I'm expecting like a whole bunch of stuff to happen and lots of people coming in in suits and it's like nothing really happens and it's kind of anticlimactic and it's time to come back to school. So sorry that it, you know, it's more scary than it needs to be. Um, but my, my hope and goal is that through conversations like this, we can say, hey, we went through it and we went through it together and we had a case there and now we know what we need to do and the people that weren't there and that had to exclude themselves, it was for some of them because they weren't wearing masks. And so the next time we don't want 87, 87 people put into isolation, we want to have masks. And so as a community, we're gonna to come together and the, the youth leaders in your school have told you they want some change and they're going to come through for you and really model change in your school and I and I really look forward to what our next conversation holds yeah thank you we've got time for a few more questions uh okay I've got I've got one that might be an easier one to answer uh as a TTOC that is over 65 I feel nervous about going into schools right now regarding masks are our own cloth masks good enough or should we only wear surgical masks Great question. The best mask that I think you should be wearing is one that fits you and that stays on and you're not messing with it because I see people wearing masks and they're constantly playing with the mask. Wear a mask that fits you comfortably around the mouth and nose and that it fits smoothly around your face as best it can. Um, if it's a cloth mask that fits you like that, we recommend at least two layers. If not, the new recommendation from the Public Health Agency of Canada was a three layer mask. But the best mask is one that fits you and you're not touching and fiddling with it and you can sit with it all day and not be bothered by it. So that's my advice. Thank you. Mr. Berry. So this one uh, is a, a Vanier parent asking the question. Uh, first of all, they, they thank you for mentioning anxiety and mental wellness needs of students and, and family members, because it's important at this time. Um, they say that anxiety is due to a lack of information. And why do parents not get informed when a student tests positive in a classroom setting? We're merely informed uh, that we are of medium risk and it's a vague description and it's misleading and it creates uncertainty. I acknowledge that we are learning and we are an imperfect system and that as we are fine tuning through, um, you know, exercises like this, receiving that feedback, um, we are in a continually um, improvement cycle. So our letters are continually improving. <laughs> in fact, we've received that feedback that medium risk is an ambiguous, um, term. What does it mean? Is it high? Is it low? No, it's somewhere in the in the middle. We've determined we're going to use the, the, the term exposure letter and you're either a high risk contact and are uh, directed or requested to isolate or have experienced an exposure. And so we are looking at modifying our language. So it just means that there was someone in your vicinity but you were not in close high risk contact. And so thank you for the feedback and we do seek to improve based on. 
Thank you. Mr. Douglas. You're muted, Mr. Douglas. Is this our last question? Because I, I could do two of them at the same time if it is. Well, uh, I think we've got time for a couple more. Okay. Um, this one is um, from uh, grandparents or parents with weak immune systems and their children are having to stay. They want to keep them home. They don't want them going to school. And they're wanting to know if they can get assignments from their teachers. And, and I think I can answer it and say, yes, if your child's gonna be home, contact the school. And certainly we could uh, look at assignments for them. But the other question is concerning the arrival and departure activities at Valley Schools, could the intermingling of cohorts and parents unmasked and or not observing proper social distancing be more effectively addressed in a timely manner, please? So I can certainly speak to this uh, because it is a question that comes up from uh, our school administration uh, a lot. Uh, they're asking, uh, what can, can we do to help encourage our families, uh, parents who are arriving and delivering students morning and picking them up after school to also model the same sorts of positive protocols that, that we are modeling by ensuring that they remain socially distanced, by ensuring that they also wear their masks uh, um, but we're not all. We're not concerned about, as we said earlier, about students uh, mixing their cohorts in an outside environment. Once we get into the classrooms and are inside, we have a controlled environment that has proven to be a safe environment. Outside, we know that children leave at the end of the day. They travel with a, a neighbor in a car. They go to dance classes or soccer or hockey. And those, those cohorts are mis mixing outside, but we have clear evidence that uh, we're not seeing students in our schools being ill because they're playing with their friends in their neighborhoods. Mr. Douglas, I'd like to go back to that first question around uh, work. I, I would like to clarify a couple of points. Our teachers have, the res have a responsibility for the <laughs> students in front of them. And we would not be asking any of our teachers to be providing uh, in-class instruction as well as instruction uh, remotely. The, their responsibility lies with their students. Under normal circumstances, if, if students are away for a short period of time, uh, by all means, we would provide them with work. But in terms of a long period of time, we would have to look at other learning options and which that would be a discussion with the, the, uh, the admin at the school or uh, someone here, one of the directors here uh, with regards to that. So I just want to make sure that we're not setting up uh, an expectation. We would do the short term, but definitely long term, our teachers and, uh, and staff are, are providing an education to the students that are there. It's unfair to say to them, we need you to do that and this. No, their, their priority are, are the students that are in their classes. So I just wanted to clarify that point. Okay, I'll jump on a quick question for our guests uh, while we still have them here. Um, can you please speak to the age range of the exposure positive COVID cases that have incurred, occurred in SD71? Specifically, have any elementary students tested positive? And if so, what have their symptoms been? I know you have a few elementary schools that were on your exposure notice. You know, I'd like to say that I have everything memorized, you guys, and I really admire that you think that I do, but I don't. Um, you know, I, I have to say that we test symptomatic people. And so the children that we have as cases, whether they're in the high school or the elementary school, were symptomatic at a point in time. So. That's, that's what I'll say about that. But I, I am sorry to say that I'd have to go back, dial it back about 375 cases to try and figure out where that was. And, and, and it wasn't significant enough that it's flagged to me that you've got widespread asymptomatic transmission in your elementary schools in any way, shape or form. These are symptomatic people. Thank you. We have time for one more question uh, and then I will this. Dr. Enns? Jessica, based on my experience in this pandemic and reviewing pediatric COVID cases, uh, my experience has been in, inevitably these, uh, these children are, are household close contacts of an adult case. 
um, and then they develop, they're already isolating as a close contact, they develop mild symptoms and because they develop any symptoms at all, they get tested. So um, that's, that's been my experience. And I'm at the other end, picking them up in the schools and we're picking up symptomatic kids at school. We're not doing point prevalence studies. I am sure that if we did, we would find some asymptomatic students. I am not favorable to doing that because it is so disruptive and it's not a risk to, to anybody that I've been able to determine. Thank you. Mr. Barry, over to you for the last question. And I just want to remind everyone, if we did not get to your question, we will. And if it's a question directed for Dr. Enz or Dr. Allison, we will make sure that uh, we send it to them. We won't keep you here all night answering those questions, but we'll send you those questions and, and we will post those answers uh, on our website. So last question, uh, Mr. Barry. So this last question, can School District 71 institute its own exposure control measures such as mask wearing or does SD 71 do they rely on the province to institute those measures? I, I can safely say that in advance of this uh, pandemic, our district had uh, a pandemic plan already in place. Having said that, the, the province, uh, BCCDC, public health have worked hand in hand to produce excellent uh, protocols for schools. We are required to develop our own safety plan for our schools and those safety plans are being uh, carefully followed in each and every one of our buildings. And the evidence you've heard tonight is that uh, we have not had students uh, ill in our schools or staff ill in our schools as a result of their time uh, in class or working in our schools. So it's, it, it proves that the protocols that we're using that are consistent from school to school, district to district, are keeping our kids safe. Thank you, Mr. Barry. And uh, first off, Dr. Allison, Dr. Enns, thank you so very much for uh, giving them your time and being so generous with your time and uh, continuing to answer our questions uh, this evening and prior to it. Uh, I know our trustees are, are, would like to express their thanks. They're, they're watching tonight and our staff would as well. And I know our parents, um, are, I'm getting emails as we're, as the session is going, thanking us. So I can't thank you enough. And to our, our families out there, our parents, our community, our students, thank you for tuning in. I hope we've been able to provide some clarity around it. This is a, a tough topic. We know that uh, there's a lot of anxiety uh, out there and a lot of uh, unanswered questions. I truly hope that this evening provided some insight and some clarity. As I mentioned earlier, we will get at these questions and we will work on them. Uh, give us a few days to do that. And uh, thank you very much.